Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. Want awesome health? How about doubling your energy? With our free awesome health course, you can get a new video and lesson every single day for 84 straight days. The course covers everything from optimizing your digestion, nutrient intake, correct health issues, including weight, skin, energy, immune system, and so much more. The course could easily be worth two or $300 for, and yet it's 100% free when you go to bioptimizer.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Dot com. Once you're there, just enter your name and email to get the first three phases of the bioptimization report. You'll get the report immediately and begin getting your video lessons each and every day from there on in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we're going to talk about an important subject that there's a lot of conjecture on, but is definitely real. And you may know someone or you may be someone who is suffering from this. We're going to talk about breast implant illness. And today, excuse me, today we have Dr. Whitfield, who is an experienced board certified plastic surgeon. He completed his surgical training and residency at Indiana University Medical Center. Dr. Whitfield focuses on providing clients with nutritional guidance, nutraceutical advice, personal genetic predisposition screening, non-invasive, minimally invasive radio frequency surgical options for treatments all over the body. He's completed over 5,000 breast procedures since 2004, including over 1,100 breast implant removals, as well as been serving as the president-elect of the Research Foundation. He gave testimony at the FDA hearings in 2019 regarding breast implant illness, and he joins us today from Austin, Texas. Dr. Whitfield, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. So this whole topic, now I have heard of <clears throat> breast implant illness and, uh, you know, as, a, as an issue, and it seems to be uh, more proliferate. Can you maybe go backwards in the history of breast implants just to get an idea and then when did these type of you know conditions start to emerge inside the maybe the medical community and then into the general public awareness right I, just so for the audience and understands my background's in oncology and oncologic reconstruction and so i taught at a university i taught plastic surgeons and did uh what's termed microsurgery and did a lot of breast reconstruction with a specific technique um, called the deep flap. And I didn't use a lot of implants. And then probably in 2008, I had a patient come to me who had a, a bad capture contracture. So for the audience, that means the, the body's native scar tissue around the implant became tight. And it happens um, certainly Women who undergo breast cancer reconstruction, it's well documented, they will have more surgeries over their lifetime when they have implants versus what's termed an autologous reconstruction, which is what I um, worked very hard to perfect in my years of training and in practice. So I would convert a um, painful or contracted breast implant reconstruction to a uh, autologous reconstruction. And back then, I didn't know exactly why things were happening the way they were happening in one specific instance. A woman came in with a very specific rash on her chest, and it would be um, episodic. And she would go to see the dermatologist or her oncologist because she's worried about other issues, and they would put her on antibiotics and or steroids. And Sometimes it would go away, sometimes it would lessen, but kind of in her own way, she probably knew that something was wrong. And then she started having pain in her chest and tightness. And I knew that, that those are mechanical symptoms. I couldn't explain the other uh, symptoms in terms of the, the rash. And mind you, this is 2008. We're not talking about right now. Right. And so I would 
And I, I just remember her specifically. I took down her reconstruction. And back then I would do uh, a complete cap select to me. It's slightly different than what I do now, meaning removing all the old scar capsule and make sure there's no residual cancer, make sure there's no signs of infection because that's the protocol we followed and uh, do the reconstruction using microvascular technique, the deep flap. And, you know, the rash goes away, the chest tightness goes away. And, you know, I didn't, at that time really correlate what was happening. So if you fast forward now and I've done um, over a thousand explants and all these things. And now what she exhibited was a sign of chronic inflammation. When it gets to your skin and you have these rashes that the derms don't understand, I feel like it's more of your body expressing. First of all, the skin is the last like end organ of this when I see chronic inflammation. Right. You may get eczema like Kashif had when he was having trouble. Um, but I see it commonly. Um, eczematous type rashes, rashes of the palms and, and feet, total body acne, things that are just not explainable. And the dermatologists don't, don't know what to do with these folks. They put them on steroids. They may put them on uh, methotrex say I, i've i've seen everything tried to immunosuppress them to get it to calm down but when the immune system for the audience so i look at breast implant illness as a chronic inflammatory process mm. an acute inflammatory process is we we go outside we step in a hole we twist our ankle and it swells up yep. the body naturally stimulates uh immune response cells are uh, activated your t-cells your b-cells these are part of your immune system your endothelial cells, your mast cells, which people hear about mast cells a lot, mast cell activation. And then they secrete cytokines and other factors that both, you know, are part of the immune response and will ultimately heal you. But after your ankles healed, those signals stop. But in the case of chronic inflammation, your body keeps sending out those signals and they don't stop. And depending on your genetic predisposition, your ability to detoxify, and then whatever you've been exposed to, food, water, air, products, you can only manage so much, and then you'll exceed your ability to metabolize, and you'll get symptoms. And I think um, knowing what I know now, when you look back, you know, each system gets affected by chronic inflammation and we can just, you can go head to toe. Neural inflammation, I have patients all the time who have sound sensitivity, light sensitivity, headache, ear, nose, and throat. We have dry eyes, dry mouth, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Um, in the chest, you can have shortness of breath, you can have palpitations. And then, you know, we'll just consider the musculoskeletal system you know, people get m bad joint pain, muscle pain, young people, like young people that shouldn't have it. You shouldn't have signs and symptoms of arthritis when you're in your thirties. It doesn't make any sense. And then they have neuropathic pain, but then finally, and more to your point with everything you've done with bio-optimizers is they have a lot of serious gut problems. Mm -hmm. um, we find people with severe problems with constipation, diarrhea, bloating, just, just chronic inflammation, because the audience should know you have a large amount of gut associated lymphatic tissue. And once that's irritated chronically, you will swell. And I've seen people gain like 30 pounds easily. Mm -hmm. And then when I do their explant, they'll within 90 days, a lot of that will just go away. Wow. That's uh, it's, it's really powerful information. I think, um, there's a, obviously with all the cosmetic pressure on women to kind of look a certain way, there's probably more and more women today choosing breast implants and they're like, oh, well, you know, I, yeah, I heard there might be some side effects, but you know, it's, it, it's, the juice is worth the squeeze in other words. And, and, and you kind of have a way, I think the natural tendency uh, with human psychology is to say, well, that's not going to be me. And if right. you already have an inflammatory loan or load, um, and I always call that the silent killer, we're all kind of internally rusting from a wide variety of things. And you don't necessarily feel it until you do, until maybe one area of your body has 
succumbed. And would you say when you talk about a genetic predisposition, so there's maybe individual genetics on, is it detoxification pathways? Is it different mutation aspects? What are the genetic factors that you're looking for that would make someone more susceptible to complications from a breast implant than, than maybe someone else? Yeah. I mean, I get asked, can I, you know, test beforehand? Is this is going to be a problem? Yeah. And the short answer is no, because of the things you mentioned. I know the genetic archetype and the specific pathways as outlined in, in how I think about it is our vitamin D metabolism, methylation pathway, how we, you know, basically deal with glutathione and then our antioxidant pathway. So for the audience, like everybody knows an antioxidant, vitamin C. So we have two enzymes. And if you have a, you know, poor functioning set of enzymes for that, you'll have more fatigue. If you have a poor glutathione pathway, which is almost incredibly predictive of my patients. In fact, today, before this call, I've seen three people who have a poor pathway. Um, they will have trouble detoxifying mold. And in Texas, we have an extreme problem with mold in general. Anybody who lives on the coast has this problem. They've all been exposed to mold. And the methylation pathway, kind of everybody's uh, becoming more and more familiar with MTHFR. Mm -hmm. And there's really you know, multiple enzymes that are involved in methylation. And then the, the vitamin D metabolism is interesting. Um, I had a, a, a show that I did with a osteoporosis expert, and he was curious about why I thought it would be important to speak on his show. And I was like, I see a lot of people with breast implants who have a lot of vitamin D metabolism issues. And, you know, whether it's the absorption or the conversion, I see it all the time. Hmm. And those are the four main things we're looking at. And once again, you know, when the bucket is full and you can metabolize no more and you keep getting chronically exposed, that's when you become more and more symptomatic. So can people manage this on their own? I think as we become more uh, aware of inflammation and how better to manage it, I've curated specific uh, supplements just to help manage inflammation and provide clarity on toxicity reports. So when I get information, first of all, I want to have, you know, whatever metric I can use to help a patient both uh, before and in the, what will invariably be a long process afterwards to help them through a detoxification process. And I've had to hire staff just to help with this because there's um, quite a bit of work that goes into that afterwards, but we see the majority of our patients are really symptomatic, have three or four mutations or multiple mutations in those pathways. You know, it's interesting. I can speak from my own experience as well. Um, when I did my uh, DNA test, not that long, uh, a few number of years back when it became available, I worked with an naturopathic doctor and, and she was uh, she was curious about my dietary lifestyle and some of the habits that I had cultivated over the years based on my own feedback. And, you know, through trial and error, I, I through trial and error, I had a boot. She said 95% of the, the things that I was, you know, more likely to develop, I had developed some mitigation strategy from like trial and exper experimentation over 20 years, but I've de dedicated my whole life to this. Right. <laughs> you can find this out in, you know, a 20 minutes after you have a test with an expert. And I think that's, this is the key element and maybe one of the problems that we live in. Um, we, we have this kind of common question that comes up. What's the one thing I need to do to do this? And it's really not that simple. There's a variety of factors that the individual has. And then there's the lifestyle components that maybe accelerating or uh, attenuating, you know, the uh, condition. And then, and then there is maybe things that you can do individually. So for example, I don't have, I have sub -op, just like you identified, I had suboptimal glutathione uh, methylation. I've got one of the MTFR uh, genes and um, I ended up developing a, a digestive health company 
<laughs> because I ran into digestive issues. <laughs> I was right. like, so I had to build a digestive company. I didn't know that I had that at the time. This was in 2003, 2004, that we didn't have availability of genetic testing. And I was like, I just got to figure something's not working in my gut. I'm not detoxing my gut properly. And that's what started me down that. And then years later, and there was a couple other things similar to that. How important is it to identify maybe your uh, optimal and suboptimal genetic variants so that you can start mitigating? And then what might you do if you know these things uh, prematurely? Well, I've seen so many things now and, and most of I, I think that I'll I'll say it this way. I, I feel like the patients are frustrated because they go see their physicians and they may get referred to specialists. And it's a hard pattern to recognize because it's a pattern of chronic inflammation all over the body that you would not normally see. And because I've done over 3000 consults and, you know, 1500 explant, I mean, to me, like when I hear it, I'm just like, Oh, I actually just think of the genetic reports associated with this and how they, are not detoxifying. So I already have some strong feelings about how their their body's working just from a, a genetic standpoint, because I've seen it so often. I think then what I try to encourage them to understand is like, this is your playbook. Once you understand this, just like you mitigated it through trial and error, you don't have to do that anymore. I'm, I'm, I can give you the game plan. Mm-hmm. The biggest problem is your food, your air, and your other environmental exposures, because I can't control those. Right. And those things can cause all sorts of havoc with anything related to wound healing in general. And um, I think highly motivated people, a players constantly push themselves and don't do a good job taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, is the hardest <laughs> behavior is always the hardest thing for me to to take care of yeah this is something i've noticed um in uh working with a wide swath of the population and i'm i'm a little bit more fortunate than most um because you know with our work in bioptimizers we we tend to have people who are actively pursuing health optimization strategies so that already segments them in a very right small percentage of the general pop population where a medical doctor is is subjected to to maybe almost on the inversion of that side people more predisposed to problems early in their life or who don't have any kind of um holistic or uh you know uh pro program in their life where they're identifying these things that could be causing complications so in your opinion what are maybe uh a few of the big factors you kind of touched on it but what are the elements that an individual listening to this podcast needs to address from a standpoint of how do i ensure that i'm not overstressed like accelerating the inflammatory conditions what things do i do in my environment what do i do dietary wise is there maybe techniques or mitigation strategies biohacking techniques whatever what, what are the things that you find most common to be, uh, uh, you know, as universal as possible. Well, we'll start with, you know, something simple like water. Mm -hmm. So I don't have people do basically anything with their water. Um, in my office, we have hydrogen water, but you don't need that. It's something we have because we have a lot of people with oxidative stress and it's, it's better to reduce that. But what I what I would tell everybody is you got to stop drinking water out of plastic bottles. So plasticizers, phthalates, things like this are commonly found on total toxicity testing when we look. And you know, I just start there and then, you know, we you know, so filtered water drinking water out of a glass or something like a Yeti. I mean, I don't support Yeti. I'm in Austin, but what the, you know, um, so that's a start. No, take yeah. plastic out of the game. The glass bottle here right. <laughs> as much as you can. Yep. And then for air quality, cause I live in Austin and I'm uniquely susceptible to mold myself. 
So I concentrate heavily on making sure in every single discussion I have with a patient, I make a recommendation. So I have nine freestanding HEPA filters in my office. Wow. And I have one right next to me right now running all the time. I have no financial relationship with them. And I use an IQ air filter, health pro plus, and it filters things down to 0.003 microns. So it takes the spores and allergens out of the air and nobody has allergies in my office. Nobody runs around coughing and sneezing because the air's very clean. So, you know, water and air and then food, I think, God, it's Pandora's box. If you can't eat well, you can't heal. So I talk to people about, all right, basic things. You educate them on gluten. So we cut gluten out of diets, dairy out of diets, no processed foods. And we really try to, you know, the sugar is a problem as it relates to healing. And then, you know, this is a big educational process for everybody explaining why on a toxicity report, you have more glyphosphates than you should. Well, glyphosphates are things that are in herbicides and pesticides. And if you, you know, think of the dirty foods like strawberries, I mean, you can get as much pesticide out of a squeezed strawberry as you can out of the pesticide used to treat the field with the strawberries. So those are just basic things we go over with everybody. But I will say the longer I've been taking care of this group of patients and the more I do, I am getting a more you know, educated client because they're seeking out and trying to learn on their own things that we have not taught well or discussed well Um over the course of years, whether it's in my profession or just in general in the society. It's great. Uh, it's funny how many uh, experts I interview come up with the same conclusions on the intake and environmental side. And I think a lot of people just think of food alone, but air and water, I, mean, I always say, well, you can live a month or so without food. You can live a few days without water and, you know, you can live maybe a minute or two without air. <laughs> so, right. If you look relative um, about understanding that, and very few people really address the air and water aspects of their health, because they're also key aspects of the detoxification process, the decarbonation of blood through exhalation. And also, you know, I always say, uh, pee in the ocean, nobody knows, pee in a pool, you know, people are upset, pee in a hot tub, it's grounds for a divorce. So <laughs> it's it's like water is a the great uh, emulsifier in our life. What are some other things? And of course, um, Matt and I got a new book coming out this year about how to, it's called the uh, Ultimate uh, Nutrition Bible, and it's helping people identify how do they figure out the strategy that's specific to them. For example, Matt's a keto guy, and I'm a plant-based guy because we're we're erring towards our own genetic predispositions and what works for us. We're, we say dietary agnostic. But on the detox side of the equation, what are... Some of the elements that someone comes in, they're obviously, um, they're in a state where the toxicity went from, you know, the host of the elements that you might have addressed and a bunch more, their own individual genetics, maybe they've had a, a breast implant surgery that's also complicating the things. What are, what do you do after you kind of straighten out their diet and address some of these diet, uh, environmental issues? What, what are some of the things that you think are helpful for the detoxification process? Well, it's a big education like we just discussed, and many of them come in so symptomatic that um, doing the surgery, although it's an aggressive maneuver, is what they need in order to lower their inflammation, and then you can proceed with a detoxification strategy based on a profile that you get on the report, and, you know, it's complicated because you have somebody who may have multiple uh, parabens or BPAs or phthalates, or they can have a host of things to detoxify from in addition to something like mold, which is very mm -hmm. complicated to detoxify from. Yes. And I, I don't want to go out and say that you can't work on these things before you do explant surgery, but it's incredibly difficult for your provider who's trying to help you to combat that process. Because if we just go to what I said in the beginning, a chronic inflammatory process, and by, by the way, the audience, I should say this, 
everybody knows because of the pandemic what a PCR test is. So we take a DNA fragment and we amplify it to know exactly what's in the sample. So, and you know, it may be uh, a nasal swab for you know coronavirus, or it may be a saliva test, what have you. And so I've done over ooh, close to a thousand PCR tests. Um, on the scar capsule and about 35% have biofilm. So for the audience, certain bacteria create biofilm readily. And the one most uh, frequently found is Cutibacterium acnes, which is in our skin of our chest, our neck, our face, our shoulders. It's in a very high concentration. So it readily makes biofilm. And so when you have a bacteria that makes biofilm, which we'll just say it's like a sugar coating, it's very hard for your body to break down that barrier and eradicate it. So now you have a chronic source of inflammation and the cellular response is going to be the same until that's eradicated. So I couple that to environmental exposure, mold exposure, heavy metal exposure, whatever that exposure is. And they're, they're frequent. I mean, we get exposed to a lot of things in daily life but you'll see people really struggle after an exposure, especially something like mold. Mm -hmm. And it just goes down South very quickly. And, you know, this is six years into the process for me. And I've seen enough and done enough and experienced enough with these clients to know that they're not going to reverse that without some help with, you know, the surgery. So I feel that's an important part. And then once we, do that. I feel like our practitioners or their practitioners, I have like 80% of my clients are out of state, but we work with them remotely as well. We can help get them on a protocol to address if it's a heavy metal issue or if it's a mold issue or if it's a environmental exposure issue, but it's a process. And, you know, initially when I started operating on this in 2016, I had a case where the patient had an E. coli infection and it was completely a cult. And it really bothered me because it was a cancer patient. My sister's a breast cancer survivor, and I would never want to miss anything on any patient. And um, this patient put me on a message board, I think, on Facebook, and I just had people start coming out of the woodwork to see me for a consultation regarding explant. And so at that point, I was really concerned that these were a lot of occult infections. So when it, when it plays out, it's about 35%, but that's incredibly high. It is really high. Can you explain what that type of infection is? And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, supercharge your protein shake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein, build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of masszymes into your shake. One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S-H-A-K-E-1-0, at masszymes.com. That's SHAKE10 at masszymes.com. Yeah, so when you have this biofilm around the implant, it's between the scar that your body forms and the surface of the implant. Mm. And implants can be smooth or textured. Textured implants have been taken completely off the market in Europe and recalled in the United States. But what I would say is this chronic irritation has led to problems with cancers, breast implant associated large cell lymphoma, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, I'm sorry, uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. I've had a personal case where a patient had a B cell lymphoma. And, you know, just think of the, you know, the secret sauce is poor genetic profile, chronic irritation, chronic inflammation, environmental exposures, however we want to, you know, yep. think about that. And that, and these are my thoughts that impedes your body's natural surveillance system of your T cells. And then you become exposed, more exposed to these 
and you become more symptomatic. You may you develop a cancer. And it's all really, you know, conceptually very hard sometimes to understand. But if you break it down and it's chronic inflammation, then all the things your body can do naturally are inhibited. Your ability to manage your thyroid, the ability to manage your sex hormones, um, your your endocrine system is uniquely sensitive to chronic inflammation. And I see it all the time. People will get put on uh, thy, uh, thyroid medication to help a hypo, you know, a lower active uh, thyroid, sorry. So hypothyroidism. And when I do their explant, they become hyperthyroid on their medication because now the medication, the bioavailability. So for the audience, you have a medication, every time you take it, it builds up to a level and it's bioavailable. That means your body can actually use it. But when I have people with chronic inflammation that I see all the time, that medication can't be as bioavailable because of the inflammation. And then when you remove the inflammatory process, in this case, do the surgery for an explant, people become uniquely susceptible. And I, I have to counsel them like, okay, you take thyroid medication. If you start having a higher heart rate, if you start getting you know, sweats, if you start getting um, what you perceive as palpitations or lightheadedness, like you really, we got to check your medication because I've had people go into thyroid storm and be hospitalized because they became sensitive, more sensitive because there's more bioavailability of the medication. If you listen to the patients talk about their experience with the doctors managing their thyroid medication, they'll say typically they've had a difficult time with management. And then when you remove it, all hell breaks loose because now the medication can actually work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that um, why I encourage people to get knowledgeable uh, medical practitioners inside their life that can actually look at a variety of different factors are that are influencing because, you know, people will see a, a YouTube video or they'll see a post on Instagram or hear something on the news or read something in a paper or hear something from the friend. And they're getting like one tiny sliver of reality without the full composite of what's going on. And they think, oh, it's just this one thing. And, and then of course, as you're you know taking someone who I've seen this so many times as people began to take a, a, an intense interest in their health and their vitality or their anti-aging protocol, or they become aware and they get really motivated and, you know, kind of reverse course in the life. And then as they, they, they make some progress and then it's like something else seems to go haywire and they're like, what's going on here? And, and, and you just cut, you've identified something that very few people actually have is that once you remove one agent in the body that can have impact on things that you might be doing uh, in other cases. I want to go back to the the breast implants here. What is it within the breast implants that are causing the problem specifically? What what, what do you think it is that's that 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 that's the triggering agent that's causing this inflammatory response, the, the buildup of bacteria, what have you? So I've experienced this with helping surgeons all over. So just so everybody understands, I'm a plastic surgeon. I did reconstruction basically my entire career. And I worked closely with orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, cardiac surgeons. Any surgeon who puts in any prosthetic material will have a complication. Mm -hmm. So nobody who puts in prosthetics of any variety is insulated from this problem. Okay. I think... My biggest experience comes from orthopedic devices where, you know, someone's got a limb issue, a knee, a hip, and, you know, this becomes, you know, not to be uh, morbid, but a life and death type situation. If you have somebody whose hip process, hip uh, implant is infected mm -hmm. and I worked with neurosurgeons with stimulators for the brain, um, cardiac surgeons who, if they did open heart surgery and they used, um, they typically use wires to close the 
the sternum or, or a system of plates and screws. Any, anytime you put anything in, it can get infected. And nobody who does this is immune. There's no surgeon anywhere alive walking the face of the earth who hasn't had a complication. If they say they haven't, they're either lying or they haven't done enough surgery. Indeed. Um, uh, one of my friends, Dr. Horace Filzer, uh, who was part of the team that put the first stent in the body, uh, I was a year or so ago, I was uh, spending some time with him. And I said, what, what have you noticed over the last, he's about 80 years old. He said, what have you noticed over the, you know, the course of your medical uh, history and surgery? He says, well, the advances in surgery have been truly extraordinary. Like, you know, when he did first was doing open heart surgeries, you know, they have to open the whole cavity up. They do all this stuff. They'd be like six months in the hospital before the person can even come out. Now they can go in with a little... Uh, device and a, and a camera and, and, and some high technology. And, you know, four days later or three days later, the person's out of the hospital. He said, and I said, well, what's the biggest challenge that has, has occurred? He said, the complications from infection. Um, it's still an ongoing problem that most of the challenges today in surgery, or at least half of them, he, he estimated, was because of you know, infections or bacteria cultures that become problematic to the system. Uh, and he has a wound healing clinic, I think, in uh, Bullhead City, uh, Arizona, and has dedicated the last part of his career to just how do we address all of these infections that are occurring with people, like chronic infections, surgery infections, open wound infections and stuff. And I think a lot of people, because surgery has become so advanced, don't really understand this. Can, can you kind of share with us Maybe if someone has to have a surgery of any sort, what, what, what are some precautionary things that they can do as an individual or post-surgery? I know at hospitals, they have very strict protocols about, uh, you know, maintaining a sterile environment. Well, what are some things that people can do individually if there is any? I think it's what we, you know, spoke about earlier. And nutrition is paramount to recovery. And so I have a whole program dedicated to this and, fundamental to the program to recovery is just nutrition. I mean, you know, we preach very hard that I need your dietary protein and I use a hundred grams. Uh, typical for just daily living is like 70 grams for an average 150 pound person. So, you know, but you're on a plant-based diet, very, very hard for some, um, vegan plant-based diets to get that much protein it just doesn't well, yeah just to weight. comment on that in my own personal nature it's funny you use that number uh so I, i'm one of the few plant-based people who have competed successfully at a national international world championship level at, in bodybuilding and if my uh protein intake slips below 100 grams my capacity to recover from training is 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 noticeable Right. And I, I have to maintain that in order. And I have all the digestive elements as well. Like I'm, ex, I'm optimizing my digestion. So I'm metabolized, but you're getting hundred grams of protein. How much of that amino acids I'm getting is probably a higher amount than someone who has a compromised digestive system or um, is, is just not good at getting complete protein. So it, I want to put a caveat. I've been successful on a plant-based diet because I'm implementing mitigation yeah. strategies to ensure I'm able to deliver enough amino acids to my recovery. And in a surgical situation or in, in, a, in a situation where you're uh, even, if, you know, it's not, it, it's over and above, say, a training result where, you know, you're stimulating your muscles or doing some breakdown, it's, it's even more prevalent. So continue on that. I just want to add that as an antidote for people. Right. So that's my toughest client. You're, you're my most difficult person to take care of because typically, that number's never even remotely being met. And yeah. then we add so much in either with uh, free aminos or increased protein, pea protein. We, I have a lot of sources, as you know, it causes early satiety. So people don't want to then eat and meaning, I'm sorry uh, for your audience. That means you're full and you, you don't want to force yourself, but like, your body's in a dormant state after surgery in terms of nitrogen balance until you improve your protein intake to a point where you're a positive nitrogen balance. And that's what we call anabolic. So you can heal. And um, 
I frequently balance uh, hormones on my patients. I look at sex hormones and I add testosterone back quite a bit as a hack because that will stimulate a change in nitrogen balance more quickly. So if we address and mitigate certain deficits in choices of foods and eliminate inflammatory foods and increase protein levels and augment their hormones if necessary, I'm trying to build an environment that's as level a playing field for recovery as possible because, and I always tell everybody who sits in front of me and says, you know, testosterone didn't work for me, Dr. Whitfield. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me that athletes risk their entire legacy salaries because drugs don't work that are performance enhancing. So <laughs> really drugs work when done in the correct dosage with the proper environment. So as you reduce the inflammation, I buffer out cortisol and estrogen in my patients because my patients are female and those are stress hormones. So I want to buffer that with testosterone to give them a jump start, if you will, on recovery. And then, you know, nutritional support getting them to take in enough protein, giving them free amino acids. These are the things that help you heal. This is, I mean, this has been fundamental to my career since I started training in surgery in 1996. I was taught by, I had incredible mentors. Uh, you know, they all rest in peace now, but they were the people that brought that type of philosophy from their training in the fifties and sixties through unfortunately conflicts and wars and, and they made it paramount that you had to be a good doctor. You had to be under you know, understanding of nutrition in order to get your surgical patient to heal. Operating was, you know, obviously the, the privilege, not the right back then. It's one of the things that I, I feel I got lucky in, um, in my own career, uh, having a history and exposure to the bodybuilding world, which bodybuilders, I always call them the original biohackers. Why they're trying to overcome, um, two genetic limitations. In other words, we've evolved not to carry too much muscle because it's detrimental for long-term survival. And we evolved to store body fat easily so that we could uh, with, uh, withstand extended periods of uh, food deprivation. And both of those are issues uh, historically. And uh, so, you know, bodybuilders are, are trying to counteract two evolutionary tendencies and have developed very rich dietary protocols, weight management protocols. And of course they were the, you know, early, uh, early advocates of using hormone therapy to augment protein synthesis and the building of muscle. Now I've chosen to go down a different route and not uh, do uh, testosterone, uh, testosterone therapy from the standpoint of sports performance. As I age, there will come a point where I'm very clear that testosterone replacement therapy will, will be a, an excellent option. And I'm trying to kick that can down the road as far as I can. Now, like it seems that over the last 10 or 15 years, the whole uh, panacea of hormone therapies as a way to augment your health, your vitality, you, you know, a, a lot of these protocols to accelerate recovery has gained widespread acceptance. You know, before nobody wanted to hear that an athlete was on drugs or uh, I can remember even as early as Lance Armstrong, I, I used to talk with my personal training clients. I said, well, I said, you know, it's, it's obvious to me that Lance is on drugs. He's just not getting caught. I don't know what he's doing. But at that level of, if you understand performance parameters and, and, the, and the sheer exhaustive nature of the Tour de France, it's, it's almost impossible to be competitive at the very highest level without them. And eventually it came out that was true. But the whole stigma has seemed to change as the general population becomes aware of the benefits. What do you feel is the difference between using um, hormone therapy to optimize healing, recovery, maybe to live a higher quality life versus the super physiological dosages that a high performance athlete or a bodybuilder or something might be doing. And how do you differentiate, differentiate between the two? Yeah, I've had people come in and request that. Um, I personally, because of, you know, what we're trying to do, and I do have people on maintenance for wellness. They're my clients. I don't, uh, 
take on clients uh, just for that purpose. It, it's it's to me become obvious that the hormones are very sensitive to inflammation. So, you know, in super therapeutic doses, you'll be able to ov- overcome that. Right. But in the general population who don't understand their environmental exposures or just their baseline, like I, I don't think most people understand inflammation and and what that that basal level is. And so you have, as you mentioned, this has become widespread. And once again, I have people come in all the time and tell me that things don't work. And I was like, <laughs> okay, you know, you have to do a little bit of uh, digging to figure out like why that's a problem. But I go back to the environment, the food, the air, the water, and you'll find the reason if you ask the questions, if you're not interested in asking the questions and you just provide the service in terms of a, what you perceive as a therapeutic dose of the hormone. I mean, you may or may not get a response. I mean, I think you and I both know that in the right situation, of course it works. And once again, you know, we don't use super therapeutic doses because what I'm trying to do is augment recovery and not get side effects. So I've not had side effects as a, as part of my, you know, treatments. And um, I think in the right situations, it will help enhance your, you know, well-being without causing side effects that are unwanted. One of the other areas that um, are used in the treatment of recovery programs and stuff uh, it seems to be gaining more popularity is the use of stem cells, exosomes, V cells, and various types of peptides to improve recovery. How, how uh, confident are you in those therapies as they are right now? And do you, what do you see in the future uh, coming down in those areas in association with uh, hormone therapy, because hormone therapy is, I think, fairly well established now. It's it's quite common, uh, I think, for men and women, say, hit into middle age to go into their medical doctor, look at their hormonal profile, and they say, hey, you know what, you're a good candidate, let's get you on some some hormone therapy, and quickly, many of the, the things that they're suffering from go away, and they live a better quality life. These new things that are emerging and um, are being used and how did, where do you see the, the role of those in, in regenerative technology? Well, first of all, for the audience, I, I don't give anything to a client that I haven't tried personally. Mm-hmm. So of all the things you just mentioned, the only thing I haven't had is V-cell. Um, I've had my own stem cells injected in my neck because I've operated since 1996 and I have a chronically degenerative neck condition. And I've tried every peptide under the sun and um exosomes we've used extensively in terms of um y- you can use them different ways um for wound healing but we're trying to get you know better scars um everybody's going to have an ability to heal the scar and and the the thing that i like probably the most of all of those having experienced them all it's my own stem cells. It's my own genetic material. Mm-hmm. And we use adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells. Um, I feel like that in terms of indi- individualized therapy is most exciting and intriguing to me. Knowing your own genetics and then focusing on you know, your diet and supplementation and using your own stem cells. And this is not Benjamin Button type stuff, but you know, your stem cells will hone in on wherever you have a problem chronically or acutely to help heal it. And for your audience, I was having such severe neck pain that um, I was having electrical shocks down my neck and shoulder into my hand and that's never good as a surgeon. That's <laughs> yeah. That's a little we call that a a wake up call. And so I've like many surgeons, I've pushed myself for a very, very long time. But um I have a lot of good friends and they directed me and uh I went out and got uh, therapy for it. And it's it's fine now. And we offer that same therapy 
uh, at my my place in Austin because, you know, the the go for my clients, and I have a lot of clients come in from all over the country, is you're never going to get a resource like our office. We have stem cell therapy. We have hyperbaric oxygen therapy in my office on site, and we have lymphatic massage and IV therapy and peptide therapy and exosomes. So, and as well as like several skin tightening devices, both non-invasive and minimally invasive. So I definitely have tried to make sure that if there's a therapeutic option that we've explored and we understand it so we can explain it. And if it's going to help you, if it would help Wade, then we're going to talk to you about it and make sure that you understand the risks and benefits. And if, if, if it's going to help you and we're in alignment, we'll use it. I love it. And I think um, I've had so many friends who are, their quality of life has gone up using these technologies. It's really exciting that there are, individuals like yourself that are leveraging a whole host of these different options for people to start, you know, and to, you know, essentially customize what's right for that particular person, where they are in their life, what's going on in their body, recognizing what they're trying to overcome, and then, you know, plotting out what's possible for them in the future. And it gets pretty exciting that we don't have to um, succumb to degenerative conditions, uh, as a result of, you know, total or, or localized inflammation. Uh, it's really exciting time to be on the planet with these uh, technologies and what they're able to do. You see, I think um, individuals like, funny enough, uh, Tom Brady was a, a great example, uh, I think, that really turned the lights on for a lot of people. Here is a guy in his 40s, you know, competing at the highest level in a in a sport where you're usually injured and fit. In. Like most people leave the NFL because of physical injuries, accumulation, aren't able to allow them to perform. He developed a whole range of protocols and leveraged a lot of this tech in order to, you know, be perhaps one of the greatest football players ever. But that gave insight to everyone else saying, well, if Tom Brady can do this at 45, what can I do at 45 as a surgeon or as, as, as a, you know, uh, uh, as a business person or as a, a nurse or as someone who is operating a profession, many professions have acute associative problems with them. Uh, surgeons, you know, like you said, neck issues, arthritic conditions, usually these type of things take surgeons out of the game oftentimes because of the refined motor units that's required. And also surgeries can be tenuous. I mean, one of these surgeries they last a long time and you have to be highly focused. So uh, I just want to circle back to one thing because you mentioned uh, inflammatory conditions on uh, the digestive system. And we see this with uh, implants and stuff. And it's an area, of course, that we've spent a lot of time in research. We have a research facility in Bosnia, which allows us to determine the impact of various bacteria and how they influence us, both on the positive side, the negative side, like quote unquote, bad bacteria, good bacteria. And I always say there's opportunist ba bacteria. Uh, how, how does like inflammatory conditions like breast implants actually implant the gut? Like how, how does that work? I think the exact mechanism is actually, we don't know. I mm -hmm. think um, from my perspective, because we get a lot of studies to look at the gut microbiome and we see a lot of things that you would, you know, correlate with leaky gut high, 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 uh, secretory IgE and, you know, just imbalances and antibodies to gliadin. And I think it goes back to food sources and, you know, for instance, I grew up near a military base. My dad was a retired military. And I always remember eating the food that we bought from the base. And I just thought it was horrible. I didn't really want to eat. And I remember I would eat like, I would beg my mom to like have canned corn because everything else was bad. And so over time, you know, the food sources certainly create inflammation, as you know, already. And I have a lot of people who alkalize water and create other problems with parasites. Um, that to me is like the biggest 
conundrum in this is the 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 intake that creates the imbalance and causes more and more inflammation. So if you already had a baseline of inflammation and you had a device added hip knee breast implant and you got a mold exposure or environmental exposure like you have now created a cycle that I call the hamster in the wheel. You're never going to get off and it's just going to get worse. I think that's uh, so apropos and why we bring experts in their field to kind of outline, hey, if you want to be healthy, it's not a one thing. It's everything. <laughs> and to be continually monitoring, because like you said, you move to a different location in life. I remember my first exposure to that was when I was a kid. My mom had an organic garden. And this is like in the 80s. You know, and we thought my mom was crazy because she wouldn't use any chemicals on the bugs or, you know, we, we thought my mom's nuts. You know, we we didn't have a microwave. She said, I don't want to use microwave. I don't want to, you know, these things. We, we, we thought mom's, 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 I'm not so sure about mom here. Right. And then I went to university. I had all, all homegrown food and, 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 you know, high quality products to, to the best my parents could get. And, and I just got used to it. And then I remember going to university and eating some of the same things that my mom would serve potatoes, vegetables, pieces. And I'm like, this is, doesn't, I don't feel the same on this food is what I had at home. And that was uh, my first insight. And, you know, it took years later to recognize the impact of things like pesticides and herbicides and how it can be disruptive and having a suboptimal uh, gut genetics. It was even more pronounced with myself. And, you know, it, even then it was another 10 or 15 years before I develop a, a full-blown digestive issue. So a lot of these things can be kind of brewing over time. And then, you know, one element kind of tips the whole, uh, tips the apple cart over, as they say. So uh, I think a lot of people have to recognize is that looking at all of these things and understanding how it interferes with your lifestyle and your genetics, as well as your environment, because I've had people who've move to one climate and notice a noticeable improvement in their health or move to some other climate and saw a major decrease and they haven't changed anything, but the environment uh, was the factor. Um, I want to turn it over to you uh, and talk a little bit about your clinic, uh, what you do, what you offer, um, how people can access your information and stuff, because this is a, a growing issue. I have, you know, having coached you know, uh, dozens and dozens of fitness competitors who usually get breast plants, implants at a relatively early age uh, because they lower their body fat to suboptimal levels for a female. And then right. they get breast implants for a cosmetic appearance. And then, you know, I get the call from them five, 10, 15 years later that, hey, wait, I, you know, I'm, I think I might have toxicity from my breast implants. I'm not sure I've been reading about it. Where do I go? Well, we're located in Austin. And we've worked very hard um, to, as I mentioned before, provide the resources in our space to take care of everybody. Um, and then we have a remote program for detoxification. So basically, we have set up a whole information site on breastimplantillnessexpert.com. And then on Instagram, on the same breast implant illness expert. And that's really, it's a, a resource where you can see both what we do in the operating room and learn about things we've been discussing because it is a, a very broad, difficult to understand topic that's not given enough bandwidth. And um, I think as time has passed, I've been able to speak with more providers, both surgeons and functional providers, and there's greater interest in understanding. Um, but it's still, you know, a process to get everybody on the same page. And personally, I feel like you need to understand your functional genomics and your food sensitivities and your gut microbiome, your hormone status, and your toxicity burden. And, and, and that may seem like it's ludicrous coming from a plastic surgeon, but I mean, these are the things you have to understand in order to get to the other side. Absolutely. And uh, well said. So, um, and, and what's the name of the clinic in Austin? So my office is called 
uh, Aloe Skin and Body by Dr. Whitfield. But in a year from now, we'll have our own brand new place with a surgery center. And we have yet to name that. Okay. Um, well, for all our listeners, uh, if you know someone who's suffering from toxicity from breast implants or may think they are, I would encourage you to talk uh, to check out the sites. We have listed them all here in the show notes so that you can easily access it. And Dr. Robert Whitfield, I want to thank you so much for joining us today because this is a topic that there, a lot of people don't know about, they don't understand. And people are suffering from. So I want to encourage uh, and thank, encourage our listeners to check you out. And I also want to thank you so much for doing this work because it's very rare for plastic surgeons to also say, hey, look, look we need to address some of the, the, the contraindications or downside of our industry from a cosmetic part and educate people properly about what some of the complications could happen from those surgeries or to deal with them and mitigate them if you've had that surgery in the past and want to live a healthy best life. So thank you for that. You're uh, a brave person and I love the fact that you're addressing these issues. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, Wade. And to all our listeners out there uh, on the Awesome Health Podcast, this is Wade T. Lightheart, of course, uh, from all of us at Bioptimizers. Thank you for listening to this podcast. And if you found it valuable, put a like or a share to someone you care about so that we can keep the message to live your best, your healthiest life for as long as possible. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll see you on the next episode. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com. <laughs>